Alien Ant Farm is best known for their cover of Michael Jackson's Smooth Criminal, and were also largely written off by critics and fans alike for being a one-hit wonder, and even worse for committing the supposed cardinal sin of having their one hit be a cover. But I think there's more to it than that. I always saw Alien Ant Farm as a really unique band made up of like legitimately great musicians with this really unusual ability to put together genres like funk, metal, and progressive rock together in a way that still felt natural and combine that with really well-written accessible songs that were tailor-made for fans of TRL, pop punk, and new metal alike. And at one point it seemed like Alien Ant Farm had a huge future ahead of them. But as we all know, that did didn't exactly happen. So how did they go from being these platinum selling artists with tons of MTV play and music featured in a bunch of video games to seemingly evaporating into thin air? And was there more to Alien Ant Farm than a Michael Jackson cover and a weird haircut? Those are the questions that I will answer in this video. And also I'd like to thank Factor for sponsoring this video. Crush your wellness goals this summer with Factor's delicious ready to eat meals with ingredients you can trust. They're fresh, never frozen meals are chef crafted, dietitian approved, and ready to eat in just two minutes. And best of all, it's delivered right to your door. That means you can skip the trip to the grocery store and all the chopping and the prep and the cleanup and all that while still getting the flavor and nutrition that you need. And if you eat out a lot, it's also a great way to save money. It's cheaper than takeout or even worse, getting delivery, which in my opinion is a complete waste of money and the food usually sucks. And also they have a ton of options. Personally, I like Calorie Smart, which is less than 550 calories per serving, but they also have options like keto, vegan and veggie, and many more. I love that I don't have to think about what I'm gonna make for lunch. I just pick something and I know that it's gonna taste good and I'm gonna hit my macro goals. So if you wanna check out Factor, and honestly, I think you should, head to factor75.com or click the link below and use the code PUNK50 to get 50% off your first Factor box and 20% off your next month of orders. That's code PUNK50 at factor75.com to get 50% off your first box plus 20% off your next month of orders. formed in 1996 by four childhood friends. Vocalist Dryden Mitchell, bassist Ty Zamora, drummer Mike Cosgrove, and guitarist Terry Corso in Riverside, California. Ty said on a Reddit AMA that he originally wanted to name the band Master of the Universe, but was eventually overruled by their guitarist Terry, who said, quote, I was daydreaming at my desk job and I thought, wouldn't it be cool if the human species were placed on Earth and cultivated by alien intelligence? Maybe the aliens added us to an atmosphere that was suitable and they've been watching us develop and colonize kind of like what a kid does with an ant farm. And originally they really just had the goal of making music as a way to escape from their boring day jobs, but they quickly began to pick up traction across Southern California, especially for their very energetic live shows. And they released their first demo called the $100 EP later that year. Well, as you might expect, that demo was a little bit rough around the edges. Even then, you could hear a lot of the elements that the band would go on to become known for. In particular, that fusion of funk metal, the kind of groovy prog rock, and vocal personality, including even an early version of Wish, which is a song that would go on to become a fan favorite after being re-recorded for their breakthrough album five years later. Even though at the time, proggy funk metal wasn't exactly an uncommon genre, which feels weird to say, but it's actually true, Alien Ant Farm always managed to make a unique flavor of it for themselves. Largely thanks to the band's very diverse range of influences that includes everything from Metallica and Black Sabbath to Michael Jackson and Queen, and even people like Edie Brickell and Tracy Chapman. Yes, you heard that right. And after a handful of regional tours, as well as a second EP called Love Songs in 19. 
the band would release their debut album called Greatest Hits. While the album didn't give them the global success that they got shortly after that, it did win them the LA Music Award for Best Independent Album, as well as a friendship with an up and coming band from Northern California called Papa Roach. <laughs> What began as just a couple bands helping each other out, swapping shows and sharing mailing lists, eventually blossomed into a full-on pact between the bands, promising that whichever band got successful first would help the other one. And a pact like this sounds well and good, but in practice, things like this usually end up being a pipe dream. Number one, because whichever band gets more successful first generally tends to focus on themselves. But even aside from that, even if a band does become really successful, they don't necessarily have a lot of influence over the other artists that their label signs. Like it's easy to say when you're just local bands hanging out that you're gonna help each other out, but when you're actually signed to a major label, good luck getting them to just sign your homies, right? Well, not long after this pact was made, Papa Roach signed to DreamWorks. Last Resort was all over TV and radio, which made their sophomore album Infest fly off the shelves. And in a very interesting turn of events, Papa Roach was handed a DreamWorks subsidiary label of their own under the name of New Noise. And guess what? They actually made good on their promise and Alien Ant Farm got signed to DreamWorks. It all started when I lost my mother. No love for myself and no love for another. So whenever a smooth criminal comes on in the Walmart parking lot and gets stuck in your head for the rest of the week, well, you have Papa Roach to thank for that. The band's breakthrough album called Anthology would begin recording just after they signed to New Noise, and it was produced by Jay Baumgartner, who was also known for producing bands like Drowning Pool, Coal Chamber, and of course, Papa Roach. While most of the album was made up of brand new material, there were a few songs re-recorded from early releases such as Wish, Movies, and Universe, but most most importantly, the band also included a little known cover of Michael Jackson at the end of the album. As Dryder Mitchell said at the time, we were playing out one night and in between two songs, Ty and Mike started to play the riff that's at the beginning. There are a couple of kids in front of the stage who totally reacted to it. And so the next day we went out and got the CD and tried to play it at rehearsal and it sounded real cool. The guys learned the few arrangements they didn't know and I went and learned the lyrics and that was it. So while the band was happy with the song and the effort that they put into the cover enough to include it on the album, they never planned on making it a single. At most, they would release it maybe as the third or fourth single, sort of at the tail end of wrapping up the album's marketing cycle. DreamWorks, however, saw things another way. The first single from the album was Movies, which personally, I liked a lot better when it came out. And while it did get the album close to going gold, which is certainly very impressive, Alien Ant Farm was very far from the level of success seen by their friends in Papa Roach. And they were okay with that. And I was more than happy with just the way that things were going and right. wanted to be one of those bands that kind of had a record that did reasonably well and then a second that kind of and kind of build right. in that way, you know? But like I said, DreamWorks was not on the same page. After the album didn't quite reach the heights that the label had hoped for, they started looking for a new single, and after hearing the cover of Smooth Criminal, they made some moves on their own that were unknown to the band. I think I remember we were touring in Germany, and you know, K-Rock was playing our single movies. A friend of mine said, uh, said yeah, your song uh, made it to number one on uh, Furious 5 at 9 kind of thing said oh wow movies is doing great and he said no smooth criminal and i just thought oh and i knew immediately what had happened the success of smooth criminal was immediate completely saturating the airwaves at the time and even now getting a pretty decent amount of radio play in some places and it's pretty clear why first of all the song itself is great so they were already starting with something awesome but you can really hear all the effort that the band put into its fresh arrangement with harmonies between the bass and guitar a vocal performance that really sort of embodies the band's kind of trade Mark balance of silliness and seriousness, the chunky guitars, great drumming, and of course, a tasty snare sound that modern hardcore drummers would sell a kidney for. The song went to number one on several different charts basically overnight, and the now iconic music video became one of the most expensive videos of its era due to all the production assets like a real light up sidewalk, a crane that connected wires to the band members to pull off his signature anti-gravity move, renting a monkey, and of course money going to Michael Jackson for all his numerous references, likeness, and the rights to using the song itself. Michael Jackson actually did see the video before it was released and made them spend even 
even more money than was originally planned. After originally pushing back on featuring the kid dancing in the mask, as the mask they were referencing was worn to cover Michael Jackson's alleged botched plastic surgeries. We had already long since done the video. The director re got everyone back on that street to reshoot this kid dancing without the mask. Oh, really? And then we sent it back to Michael Jackson. He said, you know what? I think I like it with the <laughs> mask. And while you'd be forgiven for maybe only being able to name Smooth Criminal as the only Alien Ant Farm song, if you're as old as my analytics would suggest, you may actually know more of the band's catalog than you realize. As their music was heavily featured in quite a few very popular PS2 games, most notably being the inclusion of Wish on Tony Hawk's Pro Skater 3 and Courage being in ATV off-road fury 2 and sean white's pro snowboarder and with all this newfound fame with the press radio and video play it wasn't long before a lot of rock fans basically started to think this band was a one-hit wonder and they began attracting a lot of negative attention in particular for that one hit being a cover song which is kind of interesting because there were a lot of other covers happening in the genre at the time that did quite well and i don't really remember people having any negative things to say about them for example you spin me round as covered by dope limp biscuits faith and rage against machines at renegades of funk all of which were all over rock radio. Although with the exception of Limp Bizkit, these were bands that had all broken through based on original work. Rock gotta happen! And so that brings us to the big question that they faced at the time. Could Alien Ant Farm build a solid foundation for their career with all this newfound fame, but with original music? I would like to think that the answer would have been yes, but sometimes writing good songs isn't all it takes in the fight for longevity. And in this case, Smooth Criminal did come from an album full of legitimately great, catchy, and memorable songs. The challenges that the band was about to face, unfortunately, were not so simple. Early in the morning of May 22nd, while en route to a festival in Lisbon, Portugal, the band's tour bus crashed into a parked semi doing 70 miles an hour, leaving the 26-year-old driver dead, the band's head of security in critical condition, and everyone else on board hospitalized with serious injuries, including a vertebrae fracture suffered by vocalist Dryden Mitchell. And even though the band did get back on their feet, by that time, as far as the industry was concerned, it was kind of too late. It was surreal, and it happened really fast, and it, I mean, it was overnight, but at the same time, you know, we got to a bus wreck, and it all came to a screeching halt after the bus wreck. After the incident, the band would end up in numerous lawsuits. There were also some substance abuse problems that cropped up, as well as infighting, as a result of the mounting physical and emotional trauma as fallout from the crash. And maybe most of all, their career is essentially being taken away from them through no fault of their own. But as horrific and traumatic as that event was, the band was not ready to throw in the towel yet, and about a year later, they went into the studio to record their follow-up album, True Ant, with production handled by the two brothers from Stone Temple Pilots, Robert and Dean DeLeo. True Ant ended up getting relatively favorable to mixed reviews from critics, who mostly pointed out that the band's catchy songwriting and tight performances were as good as ever, and also with a lot of praise for what they felt like were the band's more mature and emotionally dense lyrics. But unfortunately, that didn't translate into the kind of commercial success that they were all hoping for, which caused a further rift within the band that would see the departure of the founding guitarist, Terry Corso. But the bad luck unfortunately didn't end there. Just two months after the release of Truant, DreamWorks would close its doors forever after being bought by Universal, which meant the band was signed over to the Universal subsidiary Geffen, who basically locked the band behind layers and layers of red tape, leaving Alien Ant Farm essentially unable to release any new music. But being as resilient as Alien Ant Farm is, they didn't take this lying down. And so they recorded a whole other album on their own called Up in the Attic, and after Geffen refused to release it, the band began touring and selling bootleg copies themselves under the name Third Draft with exclusive artwork, which has gone on to become a really cool collector's item within the fandom. Yeah. 
After nearly a year of releasing this album in protest, Geffen eventually caved in and allowed the band to release Up in the Attic, but on a new subsidiary of Universal called New Door Records, which is a label that seems to basically serve as a dumping ground for whatever records Geffen didn't actually want to put effort into, making Alien Ant Farm label mates with everybody from Joe Cocker to Styx, Tears for Fears, and The Temptations. A fate that honestly was probably worse than just getting dropped altogether. Following the release and kind of mediocre response from Up in the Attic, the band more or less disintegrated with Zamora leaving for college, Dryden forming a side project, and everyone just kind of falling away from the band after being beaten down time and time again by label apathy, tragedy, and reviews that just didn't seem to love them. They would end up getting together again for a reunion album in 2015 titled Always and Forever, and while that would see them getting some festival dates and a collaboration with insane clown posse of all people because I guess why not the band wouldn't truly make a big comeback in the mainstream consciousness until the big nostalgia festival boom of the 2020s but the positive feelings around the band wouldn't last for long as millennials began coming into their 30s and 40s in the late 2010s and early 2020s industries around the world began basically racing to cash in on this wave of millennial nostalgia any way that they could most notably very expensive festivals like make america rock again sick new world and of course when we were young all of which saw these once popular bands from the 90s and 2000s start to release new albums and tour again. And Alien Ant Farm was no exception, announcing around this time that they were working on a new album and being added to quite a few of these festival lineups. Things were looking up again. The band was very openly excited to be back on stage and playing to people who were legitimately excited to see them. That is until vocalist Dryden Mitchell would be charged with battery for a 2022 incident where he not so subtly grabbed an audience member's hand and basically smashed it on his dong. The singer of Alien Ant Farm, Dryden Mitchell, grabbed his hand and pulled it towards his groin in the middle of the performance. As odd as this incident was, after the video went viral and began making waves all over the internet, it came to light that this actually was not the first time that an incident like this had taken place, with a 2000 video from Lake Elsinore, California, also resurfacing, showing Dryden apparently encouraging an audience member to come over the fence to get closer to him before rocking out with him and ultimately shocking the guy by grabbing his junk. Luckily, in that first incident, it seemed like the guy thought it was funny, continuing to kind of laugh and play along with it. But this incident would shine a larger light on Dryden's odd behavior and overall, I guess, grabbiness. And Dryden was actually not the only member of the band to be accused of assault on a fan. Guitarist Terry Corsa was also charged with battery in 2016 after a fan threw what he assumed was urine on him, coming just two days after Dryden had gotten urine thrown on him by an audience member, after which Terry jumped off the stage and punched the audience member. When asked about the hand incident on the Jason Ellis show in 2024, Dryden Mitchell claimed that he had to pay the victim $10,000, which in turn turn made Dryden sort of claim to be the victim because of the lawsuit. He kind of laughed the whole thing off as though it was just in good fun and said that, quote, there's no vibe of fun anymore. He then went even further, claiming that he's done it many, many times before and just kind of laughed it all off. Yeah, yeah. it was like $10,000 later, too. But it was it was inappropriate. And, and the guy, his story was and I can't see into the heart and soul of another man was like, I was OK with it at the time. And then I went home and thought about it. And I realized that it was really deeply uncool. And it, I found it very unsettling. <laughs> hey, man, he literally said, hey, man. <laughs> So, we're getting flagged. Clearly, Alien Ant Farm's reputation was never squeaky clean, and Dryden has always seemed like he was, to put it lightly, just kind of a weird guy. But regardless of the negative press and the charges, 2024 would see the first new music from the band in nine years, titled Mantras. And surprisingly enough, pretty much all the comments on their new music videos seem to be really positive. Maybe it's just their demographic largely being in their 30s or 40s and not really following social media too closely, or 
or maybe their fans just don't care about any of that. But the new music seems to be pulling in really respectable numbers with the single Fade getting over 600,000 views in two months. And the band seems to overall just be very grateful to occupy the spot in music that they do. So what do you guys think? Was Alien Ant Farm just a one hit wonder with this weird vocalist who deserved to be in the Walmart bargain bin? Or were they a great band sort of victimized by these traumatic events and apathetic record labels that didn't give a shit about them? As always, let me know what you think in the comments. And I would like to thank everyone who supports me on Patreon, especially those of you who support at the true cult level or above. Patrons get all my videos early. I also do giveaways and Q and A's sometimes. And there's a way to have me review your music. So. If any of that sounds cool, hit the link in the description of this video and I'm going to sign off for now, but I will see you next time.